begin to eat the the dust 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 Please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Good morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day and welcome to Atlanta. And Modex 2014, the greatest supply chain show on earth. We're humbled to have you here today and be your host of this week of manufacturing and supply chain solutions and innovations. My name is George Prest, CEO of MHI. After the keynote, uh, keynote, I invite you to visit over the 800 exhibitors on our show floor and 150 uh, education conferences and sessions. This morning's presentation covers shipping trends for global supply chains and features Gil West, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Delta Airlines, and William Ale Strang, President of America's Operations Group for Toto USA and Chairman of Toto Mexico. Our friends at the Metro Atlanta Chamber, Com Chamber of Commerce Supply Chain Leadership Council were instrumental in bringing this keynote to you this morning. I would like to in introduce Hala Madelmong, President of the Metro Atlanta Chamber, who will introduce you to today's speakers. Please welcome Hala. Uh, thank you very much and welcome everyone to Atlanta, Georgia. We're glad you're here and glad you're up on this rainy morning. I'm kind of sorry this is St. Patrick's Day because it doesn't feel very festive yet, but hopefully you'll have a good time at this conference and get to enjoy a little bit of our city. Uh, I am fortunate to get to say a few words about uh, what's going on in Atlanta in terms of uh, the reason you're all here and to introduce two people who are very special to us at the Metro Atlanta Chamber. So let me just um, kind of start in on my remarks. Um, you, also, you may have noticed, and I'm sure you did because I did as I was coming in, that there are two logistics events happening here at the same time. One is the Georgia Logistics Summit and the other is the Supply Chain and Transportation USA. And the fact that all three of these logistics events are happening simultaneously in Atlanta is uh, certainly no coincidence. Atlanta has grown to be a global multimodal hub for supply chain and logistics. And our region offers one of the best interconnected networks for rail, road, air, and cargo to move goods and services to virtually every point in the world. And we are home to the world's busiest airport by passenger volume, Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport. We have directly flights, excuse me, daily direct flights to more than 160 domestic um, destinations and more than 60 international destinations. The airport has consist consistently been named a top 10 international air cargo hub with more than 17 major air cargo carriers. And Atlanta is also an access point from which 80% of all U.S. consumers can be, can be reached with either in a two-hour flight or two truckload delivery days. We are unequivocally and uniquely situated among four major interstates, which is a huge boost for trucking and freight industry. The Port of Savannah, the fourth largest container port in the U.S., is also a huge asset and entry point, and many of the products that enter that port are shipped straight through Atlanta. 
And there's so many great assets here that we're so proud of and many factors that make Atlanta a true powerhouse for jobs in supply chain, manufacturing, and logistics. Metro Atlanta has the fifth largest concentration of supply chain companies with more than one million people employed in Georgia in this logistics area. Last year, the state of Georgia won the prestigious number one spot from Site Selection Magazine's annual ranking of state business climate. The rankings are based on numerous economic factors and logistics played a very big part in that. Governor Nathan Deal has noted that the state's logistics assets were instrumental in helping businesses succeed and expand in Georgia. In addition, Metro Atlanta is a large hub for manufacturing with names like Carta, Kia, Lockheed Martin, Toto, Caterpillar, and also many other well-known retailers have distribution centers here, such as Home Depot, etc. So, you can see there's an awful lot of activity that goes on in the Atlanta area. But before I introduce our new speaker, I want you to take a look at um, a survey that's in your seats. And if you've already um, been seated on yours and wrinkled it, just look to a seat beside you. <laughs> there uh, is a survey that we're going to ask you to take uh, probably sort of toward the end of the session. Uh, after you get a little bit of the session under your belt, but we certainly want to encourage you to, uh, to take that survey. It's one you take on your mobile phones. We're, we're also a highly mobile city. This is one of our uh, assets as well. So keep that survey handy. Uh, be prepared to fill it out, and at the end, I'll ask you and remind you to do so. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Bill Strang. Um, we call him Bill, not William L., because he is, a, uh, again, a very important member of our chamber. And um, he is, uh, as was said, the uh, America's Operations Group president and also the chairman of Mexico for Toto, a Japanese company. Um, and he has responsibility for all of the operations, including supply chain, design and development, engineering, quality, environment, and the management of the five Toto North American plants. And Toto, you may or may not know, is the world's largest plumbing products manufacturer with modern industry-leading products for the bathroom. And you have probably used Toto products in many restrooms around the world. The company has well, <laughs> yeah, that, it is a little odd to be talking about restrooms, but these are, we, we have them in our chamber building, and we're very happy about them. <laughs> so if you haven't used the Toto restroom, I invite all of you to just drop by our chamber building, which is a few feet down the road, and uh, experience them. Bill, I'm sure Bill had that in his remarks as well. So anyway, under Bill's leadership, Toto has received numerous awards for sustainable practices, including the U.S. EPA Water Efficiency Leadership Award, Georgia Governor Sonny Perdue's Water Conservation Leadership Award and the Chattahoochee Riverkeeper Sustainability Award. So please join me in welcoming Bill Strang to the podium. Hey guys, good morning, good morning. Um, I'm kind of a walker, so I'm gonna walk around as I give my conversation and my, my presentation to you this morning. And, and again, as, as Hala said, if you haven't had the chance to test drive a Toto washlet bidet, please stop over at the Chamber of Commerce. It will change your life, I guarantee it. Because until you've had a chance to sit on a toilet seat that's heated and will spray you off when you're done with a remote control, it is absolutely the man cave essential. You've <laughs> got to have one. OK, we'll start the presentation. We're going to talk about reshoring and nearshoring of manufacturing operations and, and driving sustainability into the supply chain. Now, I'll talk about toilets today a little bit, but bear with me. We'll get through this. It'll be very exciting, and you'll never think about toilets ever again the same way that you uh, had before, before you came here today. Okay, next. There we go. We're a Japanese company headquartered on the island of Kyushu, Japan. Uh, Southern Island. We're kind of like the, the Atlanta to New York of Kyushu to Tokyo uh, comparison. Uh, of course, we operate in lots and lots of countries around the world, about $5.3 million uh, billion dollars in sales a year. Some of the things that are driving our products and our industry today are the, age, uh, the big mega trends. We're talking about aging demographics, urbanization, 
digital evolution, globalization, and sustainability. And that last one is the primary driver for our industry. Water, energy, and the environment are hugely impactful in the way that we bring products to the marketplace and what we do in the way of manufacturing and positioning our products for the markets that we serve. Let's talk a little bit about the reshoring, nearshoring opportunities that we've got. You know, when I first joined the company about um, 10 years ago, 70% of everything that we brought into the Americas to sell, we brought in from Asia, primarily China. Today, we are manufacturing and supplying around 73% of everything that goes into the Americas from the Americas. Because we've seen, whether it's the increased costs of ocean freight, the currency exchange rates of the yuan to the US dollar, labor increases, duty impacts, GSP, uh, value-added tax rebates being taken away on some of the primary commodities out of China, long lead times, higher inventory, it goes on and on, including, quite recently, political stability. I mean, some of the things that are happening in the far western provinces of China, in the Tibetan highlands, even in Shanghai, there is a great deal of uncertainty and unrest that for us is a bit of a risk, and we want to make sure we mitigate that risk as much as possible to be able to supply products. Of course, nearshoring gives us some significant advantages. Most importantly, a lower freight rate. We also see lower labor cost increases. We also see minimal duty impacts. Mexico has a supply line, for example. Shorter lead times, inventory levels can be reduced. We also see a, a lower cash impact. If we've got product coming in from China, when I bring it off of Shanghai, it's six to eight weeks before I actually get it onshore. That's six to eight weeks of cash tied up doing nothing but carrying that inventory when I can use that cash to supply capital investment. Lower impact for quality and minimal obsolescence. Now, what's interesting is, you see right here, the transition that we've seen occurring it has been significant, but it's also helped us lower our carbon footprint. Now, I can tell you this, we, we, we do a program with UPS. We, Total was the first company in the world to participate with UPS, right, very good sized organization for distributing products to the marketplace. We were the first company in the world to participate with UPS in their carbon neutral shipment program. And I can guarantee you that the vast majority of our plumbers could really care less about our carbon footprint. But I'll tell you what, there are some people who are very engaged in that. Google, Apple, Hilton, Marriott, huge companies, large municipalities, Los Angeles, California. California was very excited about the fact that we were doing this kind of approach, putting a carbon neutral shipment program in place. Of course, UPS measures the zip code, the zip code distance that the product travels. They buy carbon offsets on our behalf and give us the credit. And I actually pay a little bit more from my freight as a result of that. But what is also quite interesting, we actually experienced an unintended consequence of that relationship with UPS. With UPS, they actually said, Bill, we like the fact that you're the first one to do this with us on a global scale. In fact, we're going to do a case study with you. They took our picture, Total making toilets. They showed us in our factory doing all the things that we do, and they actually used it as a case study. And then when every single UPS salesman went to call on their customers, they would open up the portfolio, and there's the Total case story. And you know what? We then turned every single UPS salesman into a Total salesman by just doing the right thing by just engaging in a program that was completely voluntary. So as we begin to reconstitute our supply chain and move more and more of our products from Asian supply sourcing to the Americas, and when I talk about the Americas, I'm talking about Brazil, Ecuador, Chile, uh, Mexico, all of those regions are becoming now supply sources for us. But this whole strategy has led us into a rethink of our overall strategic positioning of our manufacturing processes. Now, as, as you know, I, we run a factory in Atlanta, Georgia. And that factory, we produce 22,000 toilets a month out of that factory in Morrow, Georgia, right? Just about five minutes south of the airport. What's interesting is I can actually produce a toilet in that factory cheaper than I buy it from my best factory in Beijing and ship it over. That's where we can take 
the labor cost, all those Asian headwinds are building up and causing challenges to Asian supply sourcing and incentivizing us to rethink our strategy, which is to put small, nimble manufacturing facilities in the regions where we do business, building products for that region that are uniquely designed for the capacity and for the region that we are participating in. That's kind of a different strategy than we've seen over the past 25, 30 years. I've been in my entire career in manufacturing, and it's been very interesting to see this transition occur. So as you look at our operations around the US and around Mexico, we have a facility in Monterey, a half a million square foot facility in, in Ontario, California, and facilities here in Atlanta. And quite frankly, we chose Atlanta for a couple of very key region, re reasons. Number one, we chose Atlanta because of its logistics hub. But number two, we chose Atlanta because, quite frankly, at Hartsfield Airport, <laughs> on Delta Airlines, we can get anywhere in one hop. That's a nice thing to have because it takes away a lot of the angst and, and worries and time constraints that you may have in traveling internationally. Now, what else is driving us? I mentioned water earlier. Drought has been a huge issue. Thank goodness it's raining today, right? <laughs> and Lake Lanier is full, but it's also very interesting to see the drought and the impact it's been having. If you look across this, this page I have up here, as you look across the, the years from 2010 to 2014, the kind of drought impacts that have occurred in the US. And by the way, drought's occurring in lots of other parts of the world. We're having problems in Sao Paulo today. We're having problems in Spain. Um, but certainly, if you look at the US, this has driven a significant portion of our product design and our strategies for the US. And let me show you why. As our products, and we're going to get into the nitty gritty of toilets and urinals and faucets, right? Um, the the nitty gritty is this. The US has needed to move to lower flush performance products, but not lose performance. And the key here is making sure that we can reduce the volume of water flushed, but still remove whatever you put into the toilet. So whether it's a liquid visit or a solid visit, we can take care of it with one flush and get it all gone and make sure we do it in a way that saves as much water as possible. What's also interesting is when you go from a 1.6 gallon toilet now down to our new one gallon flush toilet, that's a 37.5% savings in water. That's significant. But also what's interesting, as we look at the evolution of the toilet, now you didn't think you'd be coming to a meeting on logistics and talking about the evolution of toilets, right? But if you talk about the evolution of toilets, it's a very interesting scenario that we walk through because we, we go from a 1.6 gallon toilet, which by the way, when you run an LCA, a life cycle assessment, and by the way, that acronym and those phrases are gonna become very common to us as we move into the next couple of years. Life cycle assessment, carbon footprinting, ethification, ecotoxicity, those kinds of characteristics are becoming more and more important to the way that we measure the success of our business. And what is interesting is the 1.6 gallon toilet represented 464 pounds of carbon to generate that toilet in a 10 year life cycle from cradle to grave to the time they actually took it out of the home, crushed it up, and put it into landfill or took it into a recycling opportunity. By just reducing the water, the water portion of that, we dropped from 1.6 to 1.28, which is the US EPA Water Sense program, voluntary. That dropped us 415 pounds of carbon to that. And by going down even further, down to one gallon flush, and not only doing water reduction, but also looking at weight reduction, local sourcing, reduced energy uses in the manufacturing, and recycled content, we dropped it to 350 pounds of carbon. That's kind of wonky, right? What's, uh, what, what does that really mean? Well, what that really means is this. LEED, which is the arbiter of new buildings and the designation of a criteria for energy efficiency and savings, has made a transition in their LEED strategy to move into what they call LEED version four, which is now requiring us to put in environmental product declarations. Oh, that's another one of those acronyms, EPDs. There's another one, HPD, Health Product Declarations. These are the new acronyms of manufacturing. These are the acronyms that are driving our business because we've got customers today who are absolutely demanding this. Now, I'll tell you this. None of these requirements are regulatory. None of these are mandatory. But it is our goal, and the things that we try to do, is we try to move into a position of being beyond compliance. By being beyond compliance, that allows us to be in, in, a, in a place where I don't want regulators 
or legislators telling us what we have to do. I want to be in a position where we can say, you know what, we've done this, or we've done that, we've made this approach, done this strategy, it's worked, let's make that the law, because I would rather be at the table than on the menu. And if we can help legislators and regulators move into that position, we're in a much stronger position going forward. But what this has done for us is, it's made us also very aware that today's consumer is very anxious and concerned about transparency. They don't believe marketing collateral anymore. They believe what they can find on Google. They believe what they can find on the internet. And that transparency is fundamental to how we run our, our business. And that transparency is key for our customers to make an informed choice. If you look at that second bullet down there, I believe that people today want to buy from companies that align their business ethics with the personal ethics of that buyer or their aspirational ethics. They may not be quite there yet, but they want to move in that direction. We want to help them achieve that aspirational ethic. We want to help them be successful in doing the right thing. And so what we do then is we bring them all kinds of information, data that is clearly defined. We started out with something called the Eco Scorecard, which gave a, a brief description of what the product actually represented. And that was perfectly acceptable for USGBC, the US Green Building Council, to move forward to put our products into those buildings and provide a higher rating for that building to either go to a gold or to a platinum status. However, it's gone beyond that now. It's gone to now what are known as transparency reports. And what that does is, at transparency reports, we actually take these toilets and we actually and analyze the complete life cycle of carbon footprint of that product going into the marketing data, going into the information regarding the performance criteria. We go into the, the e details of even the environmental data and generating something called millipoints. It's gonna get really wonky, guys. So as we begin to analyze the characteristics of our products, it's imperative that we understand what is happening to our industry and what programs we put in place to make it successful. And without a doubt, more people around the country are going to be looking for third-party reviewed, verified, and vetted information about your claims of transparency and environmental compliance. No more is it a marketing data, we are green. You just can't wear a green tie and make it work. You've got to be able to go forward with a program of details, and details that are vetted, and details that are real. Now, it gets really wonky. When you get to page two here, it gets really wonky, and we actually get into the details of uh, defining the complete life cycle assessment, the life cycle stages, all the things that are included into it, including production supply chain, delivery and transportation, the use phase, and the end of life. These are the characteristics that we measure the life cycle impact, measuring things like acidification, ecotoxicity, global warming impact, ozone depletion, smog, carcinogenics. Now, guys, believe me, this is an arduous process. It takes a lot of review, a lot of details. We ask our supply chain guys, tell us about your transportation methodologies. Tell us about the kinds of trucks and vehicles you're running your products on. Are you going intermodal? Are you going non-idle? Are you going maybe trucks like this? Yes or no? How can you help us? How can you be more successful? I mean, to tell you just how crazy this process gets, we've actually taken in our fork trucks, simple little thing, in our fork trucks in our factory, we've removed the hydrocarbon-based oils and we put soybean oil into the fork trucks instead. You know, the, the oil that moves the forks up and down? Because we'd rather buy our oil from a farmer in Iowa than from the Gulf of Mexico. Now again, some folks don't care so much about that, but there are some who are very passionate about that. And I want to make sure that I appeal to that person who's very passionate about that. And if we're doing that and bringing that solution to them, it helps us drive economies in our business. It's also helped us make some decisions about where we are and, and, and making improvements in the manufacturing process. For example, we recycle the waste heat from our kilns. We run kilns at 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, two kilns in our factory in Morrow, Georgia. I take that heat and reuse it in our factory. We buy 5.8 million kilowatts of green energy from Georgia Power. We are the single largest percentage user of green energy from Georgia Power in their entire network. Cool, right? To some people, not so much. 
But to many people, that's very cool and that's very important. What we also get into is recycling gray water, 1.5 million gallons used per month. And then we also actually, we, we actually took toilets and we made toilets that we could ship every other toilet upside down because a toilet that's kind of shaped like an L and we actually would package them like an L and ship every other toilet upside down, saving the transportation cost. We can actually double the number of pieces that fit into a trailer by just changing the paradigm of how toilets are shipped on trucks. These infographics help us tell the story of where we are. We even go into how much embedded energy is in a gallon of water delivered to your home. You take that water out of the hooch, clean it up, make it clean, up, clean enough for you to drink it, put it into your home, you use it, right? You put it down the toilet, it goes back into the sewer system, they clean it up, put it back into the hooch. That requires 0 0.0037 kilowatt hours of electricity per gallon. Why is that important? Well, that's important because we want to make sure that we're driving water conservation as well as energy conservation in everything we do. I mean, we even took a look at biomimicry to incorporate biomimicry in redesigning a urinal using an oxbow effect. By the way, an oxbow is that kind of a funky little river that you get, you see that sort of horseshoe-shaped lake that occurs along a, a flat alluvial plain for a river? That's called an oxbow where well, water travels through a urinal the same kind of way, and we actually had to change our trapway design and use biomimicry to understand the dynamics of that water flowing through that trapway. But here's where we also see a very nice opportunity. At Hartsfield-Jackson, as an example, as Hala mentioned earlier, it's a huge facility, right? What we're excited about is we're able to put products in there like our EcoPower flush valves and faucets, which, by the way, when you flush that toilet or urinal, at Hartsville Airport, as the water flows across the device, it makes its own energy by spinning a microturbine on the inside. It makes its own energy. It's off the grid, completely disassociated with any power. But what's interesting is this. We helped Hartsville Airport move from 1.6 gallon toilets to 1.28 gallon toilets. By doing that for both toilets and urinals, we helped them save 3.7 million gallons per month. That's 44 million gallons a year. And by the way, from an energy standpoint, that's 13,600 kilowatts of electricity not consumed. If that's coming from a coal-fired power plant, that's 27,000 pounds of carbon not emitted to the atmosphere. What are we doing to make our products more sustainable? What are we doing to our supply chain to make it more sustainable? What are we doing to look at the process by which we go to market and bring solutions into the future, building factories in the regions where we do business, shortening the transportation legs that we do, producing products that fit the region's needs, and reducing the impacts on our products and our processes. And guys, thank you very much, and have a wonderful day. Well, Bill, that was great for me. I, I'm actually moving into a new house, and I think I have to now reorder my toilets from someplace else. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. That was really great. Um, okay, next we're going to hear from Gil West, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at Delta Airlines. And uh, as we've already mentioned, Delta is, um, you know, headquartered here in Atlanta. And um, we've already been talking about all the destinations and all the people that they serve, but it's 165 million customers each year that Delta serves, 322 destinations, 59 countries on six continents. So we really are the biggest airport. And Delta employs nearly 80,000 employees worldwide and operates a fleet of more than 700 aircraft. And this year, um, Delta, was named the 2014 Airline of the Year by the Air Transport World Magazine, marking the first time in a decade that a North American-based carrier has earned that distinction. Gill leads the team responsible for safe, reliable operations across the globe, including more than 70,000 employees in multiple departments such as airport customer service, corporate safety, security, flight operations, and supply chain management. Previously, uh, Gil served as Senior Vice President for the Airport Customer Service and Technical Operations, 
And in his role, he's also included um, maintenance activities, flight safety, regulatory compliance, and aircraft modification. So it sounds like he's kind of done it all at Delta and other places. And he joined Delta in March 2008 and led the Delta and Northwest Airport and Customer Service merger. Prior to Delta, he was president and CEO of Laidlaw Transit Services and has also uh, uh, held leadership positions at Northwest Airlines, United Airlines, and Boeing. So I believe that Gil knows a thing or two about um, airports, airlines, and transportation and logistics. So Gil, join us on the stage, please. Good morning, thanks, Ayla. Um, welcome to Atlanta. As Bill pointed out, of course, Atlanta, you can get anywhere in the world from here. It's the biggest airport in the world, so thank you for your plugs. Um, and I hope all of you flew here on Delta today. Uh, if you did, I can guarantee you we'll get you home, although I would uh, suggest if you're going to Washington, D.C. today to wait until afternoon to try to get there because of the snow they've got. You know, if you flew the other guys, I'm afraid you're on your own, though. So, um, so. Shifting gears a little bit here. At Delta, we have, uh, we have something we call rules of the road. And uh, these rules of the road kind of document how we do business and our values uh, within Delta. And one of the rules of the road that we have is speed wins. And uh, I would argue probably speed is probably the most important aspect of any business. Um, I mean, the, the old adage, time is money, I think it's more important today than it was yesterday. And I think given, uh, you know, given the nature of Modex, um, I thought it might be appropriate just to center my comments about, um, you know, what speed means to Delta and how we manage it. So um, I'll start by saying that uh, the mindset of speed wins uh, is really, it really permeates everything that we do at Delta. Um, you know, we try to be a, a, a first mover uh, leadership position within the airline industry. And uh, I think you can see that in what we've done with uh, airline consolidation. We led consolidation. Um, we led capacity rationalization for the industry. Um, we've led investment for our customers, really, both in the product, the aircraft, as well as uh, the airports that we operate in. Um, and we've led... Uh, the use of portable electronic devices even, right, throughout all flight, uh, parts of flight. And most recently, we bought a refinery, right? So we kind of, we try to be out there and try to lead uh, in the industry. I think, you know, our view of speed, you can see it also reflected in our uh, per operational performance, you know, moving our customers as well as our bags on time. Um, we have a large cargo operation, which we've got a booth here today. I'd encourage you to see it. We've also um, got uh, a large technical operation. We call it Tech Ops internally. That's uh, maintenance and engineering that keep our aircraft flying. All that revolves around speed as well. So um, at Delta, we're very data driven, right? So we measure speed literally in every every part of our business. So. Um, I'd like to talk about kind of how we manage speed and what our strategies are. And I think that it, it really falls into four different buckets, and I'll talk about each of these. But the first bucket is process, then technology, infrastructure investments, as well as execution. So let's talk about process just for a second. Um, so a delta in process uh, really means working smarter, right? And I noticed on the, uh, the um, pillars outside, there's numerous workshops here over, over today, I think, and tomorrow on different, uh, different ways from a process standpoint to work smarter. And I remember back, it's been a number of years ago, uh, I had a boss that was giving me a performance review at the time, and I think he put it really nice. He said, look, he goes, life's tough. It's tougher if you're stupid, okay? And uh, it's kind of tough feedback, but I mean, I think what he was saying is that uh, you got to work smarter, right? It's all about working smarter and smarter. So, and that's really what process is is just working smarter. Now, um, here in Atlanta, we're blessed to have uh, one of the best engineering schools in the country. I, I wouldn't, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get in, I guess, so I didn't go there, but it's uh, Georgia Tech right here in our backyard. And uh, they've got a world-class industrial engineering program. So we've got, uh, you know, we hire a lot of uh, Georgia Tech industrial engineers that really help us take it to the next level from, uh, from a process standpoint. Um, and also from a process standpoint, uh, I would say at Delta, 
Um, literally in all our operations, we deploy um, theory of constraint strategies, if you're familiar with that, uh, LEI Goldratt um, philosophies, and that we manage our operations um, through theory of constraints. We also use a lot of lean tools, you know, Six Sigma, et cetera, to, to supplement those strategies so that we can execute process. Um, so ultimately, you see the effect of Delta um, focus on process. Um, and what it means to us, we're top of the industry uh, results in terms of uh, our uh, on-time rankings. Um, we've, uh, we've also got industry leading uh, commercial uh, repair capability in our technical operations where we lead the industry in engine and component repair turnaround times. And that's a, that's a key piece of uh, what we do. At the same time, just last year, we reduced inventory ownership over $300 million in a year, um, while at the same time uh, reaching record serviceable part levels against our bin allocations. So um, process is the first part of the four-part strategy. Technology is the second part of our uh, speed win strategy. And we literally invest hundreds of millions of dollars annually in technology. And the technology investments that we make, um, I think they, they benefit our customers directly, so a lot of the technology that you would see and use uh, is certainly part of that, as well as uh, we develop new tools for our uh, employees, right, so that they've got better tools so that they can do a better job from a customer service standpoint operationally as well as from a productivity standpoint. So just a couple of examples of this. Um, a couple of years ago, if you go back a few years ago, and if we had a flight canceled, right, as a customer, um, you were kind of forced to walk through the, uh, what I would call the wilderness of the airport, looking for long lines to stand in, so you get rebooked to go wherever you're going, right? I think you fast forward today, and uh, at Delta, we proactively rebook our customers if we have a flight canceled, um, so that uh, we'll rebook your itinerary on the next available flight to where you're going. Right? We'll send, you, we'll send you a message to that effect. You can use your old boarding pass to board a new flight. We've got need help centers that have some um, self-service technology out there to use and .com and as well as uh, apps that you can use to help uh, book, rebook on. Now, um, so that, that, that's really helped us eliminate longer lines during cancellations, but the reality is still only about 50% of our customers take the flights that they're proactively rebooked on, right? So, I mean, some people, of course, don't travel if, you know, if a meeting's canceled. Um, and then some people figure out, well, you know, there's an al alternative airport that I can go to, so instead of going into Miami, hey, I can go into Fort Lauderdale and maybe get there quicker or cross a different hub as an example. So it's tough for us to guess from a customer standpoint what's optimal for our customers. So we take kind of our best shot at it, rebook people proactively, and now we continue to invest to give people more decision-making power themselves on what the other options are rather than have to call somebody or speak to or see an agent or stand in the line ultimately. So um, that technology where we're, we, uh, we're deploying now push messages, where not only tell you where you've been rebooked, but it gives you a couple of other options if you want to pursue those. You know, our, uh, our uh, applications, our need help centers, all that, the functionality we continue to build out to put really more decision power in the hands of our customers. But it's, it's all about leveraging the investments that we've made in our back-end systems through mobile technology, and it's been a, I think it continues to be a, a game changer for us. Third piece of our speed win strategy is infrastructure. And we are, we're always looking for um, high leverage infrastructure investments, really that help our operational performance, our customer service, or our profitability. Um, and we've invested and continue to invest literally billions of dollars uh, in our products, in our airports, um, you know, aircraft interiors. Um, you know, in fact, uh, international Wi-Fi systems is the latest thing that we've invested in. So you'll see that if you fly us internationally, it's uh, being, being implemented right now. So an example of uh, infrastructure investment, and um, Bill mentioned uh, earlier, you know, Atlanta is the busiest airport in the world, right? So logistics are a real challenge here. And I would say probably the biggest logistical challenge is baggage, right? Um, so over the last five years, um, we've invested about $125 million in our baggage system here in Atlanta. And um, so if you go back five years ago, six years ago, and before, 
you know, our baggage transfer process, it's very complex. If you think about the number of flights that we've got, the number of gates, the geography that we cover, um, the timing associated with all of that, it's, it's very complex. Um, so five, six years ago, the toughest bags that we had to connect or transfer were bags that have been here the longest, believe it or not. You'd think they'd be the easiest. The reality is it, it's the, it was the toughest because, you know, if a bag came to Atlanta three, four hours ahead of their connecting flight, we would manually have to stage that bag somewhere, park it, and then uh, remember to come back and get it, you know, four or five hours later to go to the flight. So a um, lot of opportunity for uh, error in that process, right? So the, in the infrastructure investment that we continue to make in our baggage system here, we implemented uh, something we call internally cold bag storage. So the system, um, it's a robust system, a lot of automation to the system, and we can program it a lot of different ways, and we look at the process, statistical controls, that sort of stuff. So now we put our bags in that came in four or five hours early for the flight into the system. They're held in the system in this cold bag storage. So then they, uh, it's programmed to drop really just in time for the flight on a pre predetermined pier that we have underneath the airport operations. And then our folks from baggage transfer make that run, take it out to the gate. So the net effect of all of that is um, five, six years ago, we were among the bottom in the industry for baggage performance. Today, we're at the very top of the industry for baggage performance. And then finally, um, execution, which I would argue is the, probably the most important part of speed wins, right? Um, and uh, I've talked about the rules of the road. We've got a couple other rules of the road I'd probably mention, one of which is um, you get what you measure, right? And um, so that uh, at Delta, we've got a well thought out set of measurable metrics and goals. It all starts at our airline level something we call the flight plan. So each year we have a flight plan. It looks similar, it's structured the same, but you know the goals kind of change. So uh, it's all about what are we gonna accomplish this year. And we take that flight plan at the airline level and then we cascade it all the way through the organization. So operationally we cascade it to our frontline employees, right? And, um, and uh, so that the frontline folks have good tangible goals that we're working towards. You know, in our operational goals, there's generally four different areas that we take goals at. There's safety-related goals, there's operational-related goals, customer service, and financial goals. Um, and uh, we've got another philosophy at Delta, you know, and I, I just sum it up by saying that um, good performance does not equal bad performance plus a good excuse, right? So, um, you know, whether it's weather or... Um, you name it, you know, we can't internally, we just can't write things off because of uh, something that may be viewed as external impacted us. So um, once we take the goals, you know, the expectation is we execute around those. Um, we've got a got to have it all mentality around our goals so that we're just not looking at one different area, one area to execute on. We've got to achieve all those areas because there's a balance there. Um, we've got good, strong accountability but we've got a nice reward system that's tied to uh, accomplishment of those goals at literally at all levels throughout, uh, throughout the airline. And I would, uh, I would also um, say that the real secret sauce at Delta for ensuring execution really is our employees and the culture at Delta. Within the industry, I don't think there's anybody that's got that make it happen attitude better. So when you're able to dovetail on process and technology and infrastructure on top of that, you know, it makes for, uh, it makes for success for sure. Um, and ultimately, it's led us to the very top of the industry again. Operational performance, right, which is the foundation for, uh, for us as an airline. With that foundation, um, the best in the industry, we're able to overlay customer service on top of it, right? And there's been a tremendous amount of focus on customer service. We cut the data, all those surveys that you fill out. It, um, I could probably spend an hour or two talking about how we use that data to improve our customer service. And all that led, led then to um, the best in the industry, financial performance and profitability as well. So, um, you know, the, over the last few years, we've had, uh, we've had record performance internal, the Delta. And uh, I can tell you, uh, if you knew our CEO, you would know he sets the bar pretty high. Um, so no matter what we accomplish, the next year, bar set even higher, right? And we kind of have that collective moan, oh, how are we going to accomplish these goals, right? And we go back, 
brainstorm and, and come up with strategies, and then the next year, you know, we're able to accomplish those, and it just never ends. So continuous improvement is absolutely key in everything we do. Um, the, the industry is a humbling business, right? Because um, you know you're not perfect, you know, any given day. Um, you know, it can be a humbling experience, right? So we're always looking for lessons learned. I think that's the beauty of a conference like this is it's not just looking for ideas to cross-pollinize within our industry, but cross industries, you know, looking for those best practices and looking for how do you implement those, you know, to the benefit of your own company is key. Um, so just in closure, speed wins, right? Um, certainly does in our industry, I would say it probably is at yours. We're obsessed with speed at Delta. Um, and uh, again, it's a humbling business for us. And uh, we continue to strive from a continuous improvement to be the best in the industry. And for us, it's about, uh, it's really about having the tools, the processes, the investments that we need to take care of our employees who ultimately take care of you as customers. And then uh, that all leads to taking care of our owners. So thank you and I hope to see you on a Delta flight soon. Thanks. to take questions now. Uh, we have three microphones. If you would simply raise your hand, we'll come to you. No questions about toilets? <laughs> come on, guys. <laughs> Work us like as a sled dog. A, as an owner of a Toto toilet with that <laughs> electronic device, I would say you're right. It's a <laughs> game changer for sure. You yeah. got it. And please, go to the chamber and test drive one. It will yeah. change your life. <laughs> Bill. Yes. Your carbon footprint. Where are your competitors on carbon footprint? Or are you kind of leading the industry? That, that's a great question. Um, so I, I'm from Wisconsin. Go ahead. So Kohler would be one of your competitors. Yeah, Kohler and American um, Standard yeah. are the two primary competitors that we have, yes. And, and from the standpoint of carbon footprint and life cycle assessment, the work that we're doing um, certainly is ahead of the curve. No one else in our industry, no one else in our trade has transparency reports on our website, on the marketplace. Uh, we've used it to actually drive our decisions about capital investment and about placement of factories and operations. Uh, now, I know uh, Kohler, smart guys, American Standard, a bunch of good guys. We know them all. It's a small industry. There's only three or four of us in the industry. We know each other really well. Uh, they're doing good things. I mean, they're, they're moving forward. But as Gil mentioned, speed wins and first market wins, and the ability to do that is, is critical to your ongoing success. And, and I would recommend to all of you in the logistics business here, please understand that speed also must incorporate a level of, of sustainability in the process by which you bring the products to us and then take them from us to our customers. Help us be more sustainable. Customers will reward us, all of us, with more business for those who are proactive and moving forward in that direction. Hello, my name is Adam. Um, with drones being in our possible future um, with logistics, um, what is Delta doing to kind of address and take part in that? Well, we've got drones that uh, are the size of 747s. So yeah, yeah, we're uh, you know we're you know fr from a from a logistics standpoint, you know we do have an infrastructure and an airline, right? So um, we've got uh, not only for our passengers and bags, but cargo as an example. You know, cargo is an ancillary business for us that uh, you know is almost a billion dollar business, right? So. Um, moving the logistics, being able to uh, operate, um, you know, a cargo business within an airline is very important to us. We continue, the investments that I talked about making um, both in technology and infrastructure is also valid for our cargo business um, as we continue to develop there. Um, and technology is key, right? RFID, um, you know, as, as an airline, we're moving more and more towards RFID as well, um, that not only for uh, um, baggage, bag tags and some of our operations contain RFID, but also cargo logistics that are in the future as well. But, you know, from a drone standpoint, now um, we're not out, you know, looking to buy drones because, you know, we've got some that'll see several hundred people ourselves. So, yeah. but it's the same concept, I would argue, very similar. 
This this is Tom. Uh, I was just wondering if you would uh, elaborate a little bit more on what trends you're seeing in air cargo and how Delta is reacting to those trends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. And I'll, I'll preface my comments by, um, you know, cargo is an area that currently I don't, I don't have responsibility for. So if you want some more specifics, you know, you can visit our cargo, um, our cargo display uh, in the uh, exhibit hall. But I, I would say the macro trends from cargo, um, you know, there's generally there's been some softness in the market. Of course, it follows economics. Um, you know, as the economies ebb and flow, I think cargo business obviously follows um, follows those trends in GDP. Um, you know, so areas that were hot, you know, a number of years ago, in particular China and some of Asia, as those economies have slowed some, I think we we see the effect of that in the cargo business. Um, so I think you see competitors in cargo come and go. Um, you know, and it's a tough business model as a standalone cargo provider, I would, I would suspect. Um, we're fortunate in that we've got an infrastructure that doesn't necessarily rely on our cargo business to operate, right, but with our passenger airlines. Having said that, cargo is very important to us and obviously helps us um, balance, you know, our profit model. And it, it is space, ultimately, that we have on the aircraft that we can utilize for, you know, very little incremental cost to use it. So. Um, from our view, it is a bit of an opportunity to capture market share, you know, or do different things that uh, with our model that's not wholly dependent on cargo, it's a more diversified model to just stand alone cargo carriers. But, um, you know, I would say that business really follows uh, the, the economies from a uh, geographic standpoint. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, what kinds of investments are, are both of you making in automation to reduce the cost of the supply chain, improve the speed? Looking out over the next three to five years, robotics, you know, other kind of artificial intelligence, those kinds of things. Well, one of the things that we're doing in our manufacturing process, as well as our logistics uh, handling process, um, we're looking at whether or not we can go to forklifts that are drones. Uh, that are actually remote uh, vehicles, uh, automated vehicles. Um, we've, we've toyed with that a little bit in Japan, had some reasonable success, uh, actually took them away because the technology wasn't quite robust enough yet for that application. But we're beginning to look at it um, actually over here in the US right now. So that's one of the things that I'm actually looking at. You know, I, I, you know, I talked some about the technology that we've invested in Delta. I think from our, our vantage point, um, you know, and I'll, go, I'll talk some about our technical operations, I guess, um, because it's more what you would expect a traditional manufacturing environment to be like, uh, although it's a little challenging because it's really remanufacturing because we'll take an aircraft engine that's maybe a $20, $20 million asset, bring it in, and overhaul it, right? So the demand side of that process is unknown. Um, but yet, yet it is a manufacturing process in that, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're assembling it on the backside. We inspect it, um, we overhaul parts, we replace parts, and then we reassemble it. Um, you know, so from a technology and in, in, um, investments within that business, it's a core business for us, by the way, um, and a strategic advantage for our airline. In fact, we, we're, uh, it's, a, it's also an ancillary business that we do work for almost a billion dollars worth of uh, work for other airlines. And um, so we're, we're always looking for those, those right investments. And again, it's all about speed. It's all about turnaround time for those assets, as you know, quicker the turnaround time, the fewer of them you own, right? Um, and uh, the engine business in particular, it's a very complex uh, process, um, the overhaul of engines. And um, there, I mentioned theory of constraints earlier, and, um, and our view is uh, if, uh, if you're gonna make an infrastructure investment, it's really gotta be centered around the constraint in your process. Otherwise, I mean, you can add robotics to part of your process, but it really doesn't do anything from your overall capacity, right? It's, you know, it's, you may get a local efficiency, but in terms of global efficiency uh, in that process, it would, would have no effect. So we're very cautious in terms of our constraints within that engine overhaul repair process. Where do we target our investments? And um, actually a large portion of them um, are, uh, it's really what I would call process management systems. It's, uh, it's not hard dollar investment. It, it's more 
how do you arrange the process, how do you manage you know, induction and flow relative to our constraints, you know, and the processes around that. There are some uh, technology investments associated with that. I think um, we do tend to buffer our, uh, you know, our protection inventory buffers around uh, our constraints so that we don't dry up our constraints. And that, you know, I think all that's true in, in what I call our maintenance engineering organization. It's also true at the airline level, trying to manage our flow from a, from a departure standpoint at the airline level the same way, right? So that we're, um, we know what our capacity is at any given point in time. We know what our constraints are for any given airport, and that constraint may vary from airport to airport. Um, you know, in, it, in Atlanta on a clear day, tends to be gates. In New York, it tends to be air traffic control. In a, in a winter storm, it tends to be de-icing, maybe even at the same airport. So um, we've got an operational control center that we keep investing in both technology um, as well as human resource so that we can better manage those constraints so that we know what they are. We've got a good analytical model in terms of understanding our capacity, what we can operate in. Um, we also thin and proactively uh, manage capacity. Um, our snowmageddon that we had in Atlanta with two inches of snow a few months ago that brought the city to the knees in a sense. Um, you know, we manage capacity there, so we don't just try to run a full operation and take everybody out to the airport, you know, and everybody standing there can't get out of the airport for days. You know, we understand what our capacity is and thin. But that involves infrastructure investment. So we've, we've implemented over the last three, four years uh, ground tracking systems at the airport, GPS ground tracking systems on the aircraft that we know exactly where every aircraft is on that airport, and then we can manage our flow with a, with a lot more science than would have been possible five years ago, where you know when they're at the gate, and you push the aircraft, but you don't know what happens after that other than when they get in the air, right? Now with the technology leveraging, you know, ground tracking, we're able to see all that in a science and then manage all of that, both not only within the station, but also the arrival traffic so we can balance the flow in and out of an airport. All right. Good morning, Gil. I have a question uh, about uh, baggage. Mm -hmm. Um, I love your theory with speed wins. I definitely agree with that. And with that, uh, quality is also a factor. Yep. So with uh, the baggage, you say you guys are number one in the industry right now. Mm -hmm. What does that look like as far as uh, defects? Is it per 10,000, yep. per 1 million bag ship? Yep. How does that look to be number one? No, thanks. That's a great question. Um, yeah, so baggage, obviously important to us. We made the infrastructure investments I mentioned. Um, we've also made a lot of technology investments that help us there. Um, so to kind of put it in perspective, um, our files that we were that uh, we have, that's a DOT metric, by the way, so there's a lot of transparency for this in the industry. Our files are two per 1,000 passengers, so we're 99.8% successful. The point .2 um, that, uh, that files we do take, 97% um, of those bags get back to the customer within 24 hours. So if you look at the actual bags that we misplaced that we don't find, um, then it, it's, it's, it's literally a Six Sigma type um, statistical process where we're very, um, knock on wood, we're, 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 uh, we're, we're very good from a compliance standpoint. But the reality is if you're a customer, and I bet you're, there's customers here maybe that we've lost or misplaced your bag, it's a painful process. So the other piece that we've done is invest heavily on our service recovery side. Because you know once you start running 99, by the time you actually look at the bags lost, 99.995 kind of a range, it's tough to get that next decimal point, right? And then you, then you argue, is it worth that investment? You know, is it worth spending several hundred more million to get another .001 of performance? So we, we've also been investing on the service recovery side um, with that so that we're, um, you know, if we have a claim, the same kind of things that I talked about uh, in the case of flights canceled, how do we manage that better through applications, through kiosks, through, you know, improving line weights. Um, also, um, the surveys that we have uh, are important for us in that. You know, how did we handle that claim, you know, and the scores that we have so that we reduce, you know, our customer pain points in the event that we've lost them. 
um, but also our recovery times, our delivery times. If we do get, you know, if we have misplaced a bag, we want to get it back to you. So we measure the time it takes, you know, to get it back to you. We've deployed technology there so that we, you can see your bag, you know, on our app to understand exactly where it is. Um, you can see who the, who the, you know, if we misplaced it, who the delivery driver is, when they're going to be there. Um, with your bag. So that's the kind of the next tier that we focus at. So we do try to drive Six Sigma level, um, you know, performance on our bag performance, and that never ends. We're, we're continually obsessed with that. Um, but then at the same time, uh, the service recovery side is very important to us to try to improve on that as well when we do misplace a bag. All right, Gary. Uh, please, this is for both of you. Uh, this is a supply chain, logistics, transportation uh, trade show. <clears throat> what, uh, to what level, if at all, do you rely upon uh, third-party logistics providers to, uh, to assist you in, in, uh, in meeting your goals and objectives? Uh, as a logistics company, we think that we probably do this better than most people, and you manufacture and uh, engineer better than most people? Uh, great question. Um, we actually do use a 3PL at Toto here in the US. We use a little company called Excel. And uh, Excel runs our 3PL. They take care of our transportation management system as well as our warehouse management system, running our million plus square feet worth of warehousing for toilets, faucets, showers, and urinals. And without a doubt, um, being able to leverage their resources not only gives us the opportunity to utilize their software packages, their, their system solutions, but it also allows us to sort of bridge the cyclicality of monthly business levels. Early parts of the month, we may see a slow week or two where we're not running at 100% utilization of our warehouse personnel we actually use a pool of employees within the campus that then get offloaded to another part of the campus. They will come back on week two or week three when our load picks up to 100 to 120 to 130% of normal throughput capacity. So utilizing a, a 3PL for us has been invaluable in our ability to step into the U.S. market and continue to grow. So, um, yeah, for us, I would say a couple of things. One, I go back a few years ago, I would say logistics um, on, in terms of shipping parts and inventory for us to support the airline um, wasn't a core competency, candidly. Um, we've since brought in some talent um, that's world class. The leader um, was from International uh, and uh, has, uh, has really transformed our stores and logistics operation. Um, We've, uh, we've also, I'll put in a plug for another Atlanta company, um, uh, Porsche Consulting is based here for the Americas. Um, they're world class, you know, I've had, uh, I'm a Porsche fanatic, as a side note, but I uh, was able to tour a Stuttgart uh, factory once and I think just, it's amazing the level of process and technology and logistics um, that they have. I've never seen anywhere um, from a lean ownership standpoint as lean as that. So we brought them in to, to help with our team that's relatively new, I say relatively new, three, four years uh, with the airline now, um, to help us partner to figure out what, you know, how can we better, better use logistics and how can we make this a, you know, a strength rather than maybe than a weakness that it was. And, it, and uh, we've come a long way in that area. Um, you know, the other piece um, that we have, too, is um, we are, you know, everywhere we need parts, right? We fly there, so, you know, leveraging our own internal capacity is key, but um, we also le use a number of third-party logistics um, shippers as well. We do, uh, we have maintenance performed on our aircraft all over the world, um, and in some cases, and we've got a balanced supply chain, you know, there's some things Delta does, and that's our, and that's a core competency for us. There's other things that we're candidly not competitive in the marketplace, and we use other um, third parties to do. The logistics associated with that, you know, there's been a lot of process engineering, we use third parties, we ship directly 
direct rather than bringing things through the mothership at Delta and Atlanta and then back out, right? So we look for, again, speed wins. You know, how quick, can, how quick does our inventory turn? You know, what's the process? What's the value add in those, in those processes? And we, and we end up utilizing third party change to do that. We also have, from a supply chain standpoint, I mean, we have billions of dollars of spend annually. Um, so, you know, there's strategies around that and the logistics around that so that ultimately we can have some of our business partners buffer our stock in certain places. Ideally, of course, we don't own it, right? Um, that we've got third party agreements um, from a part standpoint, um, logistic standpoint, and we pay as we use, right? So that uh, it, it also drives our uh, business partners to be more and more efficient and, and have better control over their, uh, their own assets as well. Okay, I'm told we have time for one more question. Uh, hello, uh, I'm from a sensor company, and I'm also involved in robotics. I'm amazed about the, the watch lab. Mm. And by the way, this day still manual control, or do you, do you have any sensor to watch right on the target? Uh, manual control. Okay. We let you make the aim. But <laughs> by the way, there, there's this, there's this the, not to get too creepy about it, but there's this whole aiming technology that we talk about where to spray to make sure it hits the target. We let you make that choice. <laughs> okay, because not everything automate, but I hope that in the future, Hi. everybody can program and, and they will know, the toilet will know where to watch. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you. I have to think that's an excellent question to end on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hadn't thought about that. I think it's fascinating. Thank you for that. Um, let me encourage you uh, one more time to please fill out your surveys. And I want to point one thing out about them. In the two line where you, you know, we're sending this to, the number is 22333. Three, three, and then your voting rank, um, however you're ranking these, go in the message line. So please do uh, fill those surveys out. And um, how about a round of applause for our presenters? I learned a lot and enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much for being in Atlanta. Please get out and spend money uh, to strengthen our economy. <laughs> I have to say that since I'm with the Metro Chamber. So thank you very much. Take care.